Good morning, everybody, and welcome into the half. You probably have already noticed that we are short <laughs> one person from the half. Apparently, it's the quarter this time. Due to some unforeseen circumstances, uh, you're going to have me soloing the half this morning. So uh, hopefully, you guys are fans of the Take Up because you're going to get Take Up Junior, <laughs> Take Up Light this morning because it is just me, Eric Campbell, here to talk to you about all things apparel decoration and way beyond. So if you want to talk about anything in the apparel decoration space, in the embroidery space, and you have questions, comments, stuff you want to discuss, by all means, jump in live to the comments and you can derail the show. I will let you ask or talk about whatever you want to. But if not, I will go ahead and jump in and provide some commentary, some things that I'm thinking about this morning, and some things related also to the show that we just had over the two regular guys. You guys know that usually it's me, myself, and uh, Aaron Montgomery, and I'm the producer of Two Regular Guys, and he is one of the wonderful co-hosts. Well, we had an incredible day today on the Two Regular Guys. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, you weren't there for the live show, go check it out on the replay. We had Joe Kramer, who is now of uh, recently of Amber Creative, and who did incredible work digitizing, developing techniques, stuff for uh, Abercrombie & Fitch, among others. But that was the real big place that you may know that he worked for and did some incredible stuff with Applique. So if you didn't check that out to this morning, go check it on the replay. It's well worth it to uh, listen in and see some of the samples that Joe put together. And this is not just because Joe and I agree on so many things that he could have been uh, you know, teaching out of my playbook. <laughs> Not just, but there's a lot of stuff he talked about, including uh, how to increase perceived value, things that you can execute uh, with your embroidery machines right here and right now, and uh, things in that nature where it's like, what can we do to elevate what we do? But we also talked pretty frankly about some of the things that are going on, where he's seeing uh, high-end decoration to some degree get a little less bombastic, a little less layered. And I remember this distinctly. If you guys don't remember kind of the, uh, there is this entire kind of norm core period, this period where we didn't really do a lot of decoration, where everything looked like uh, giveaway hats from the 90s, the dad hat revolution, where we had tiny images on the front of unstructured hats. That happened a few years ago. And previous to that, there's been another movement. I remember distinctly in my career, a period of time where all of the decorations went to trying to show as little of the decoration as possible. So funny enough, our high-end clients uh, the only way to kind of get more juice out of each interaction with them was to sell them on higher end apparel because our high end clients were actually looking for less decoration. We were doing tonal work, tone on tone, single color, small, low stitch counts. So by the way, if you guys have ever wondered why uh, someone like me might rail against the idea, uh, you know, kind of rage against this concept of 99 cents per stitch is the only way we get paid. Uh, I've lived through several iterations of the low decoration revolution where decorations were way smaller, were way less intricate, and literally stitch count was going to bankrupt you because the time you spent getting something on and off of the machine, steaming it, putting it in a box was taking longer than the stitch count times, you know, the time of taking the stitch on the machines. And quite frankly, that is something you need to think about. Uh, there are times where those revolutions in style will come around and make what you do at the very least, adding more labor into what you do less less valuable, whereas creative solutions to adding texture, creative solutions to using materials, and the ability to explain value to someone and help them get a solution is going to make you more valuable. So like I always say, you know, be a consultant, not a commodity, and understand that stitch count alone can't be everything you do. All right, but we've got a couple of folks who are tuning in, and I wanted to say hi to everybody. As you guys know, the half was our space to say hi to our community and discuss things and talk. So I'm going to say hi to folks and give some shout outs. Uh, first of all, we've got Lyndon, who was in early morning, guys, tuning in from North Carolina. Thank you for being here, Lyndon. Uh, Susan Kennedy saying, hi, all love these podcasts, helping me grow in the field. And she's got some questions about getting someone to help her with patches. If you know anything that can help her, jump in the comments and answer Susan about that. If you're someone who can get to a large order of patches this month. Ramona is saying good morning. Good morning, Ramona. Frank says, good afternoon, all. Good afternoon, Frank. And thank you, as always, for being a big part of the community and sharing and helping in your own groups. Uh, Frank is among some of the best at getting people this information and helping them learn. And that's something he does at his own cost. So that's something awesome. Great thing we've learned also from Joe today, because Joe is all about sharing. The people who I find who are influential, who have a voice in this industry, who are consistently out in front of everybody, what's the one thing that binds all of them together? And I like to believe that I'm, I'm on this, uh, you know, at least on this page with those folks, uh, is that they give freely of the things they know and they think about legacy. What are we going to leave behind for the decorators that come after us and the new decorators who are coming into the industry? And that is the chief thing 
I think that we think about. And I think that's something that was really valuable about what Joe said today. He was on it sharing everything. So it was really great. Uh, Ramon is going to go watch again. I, I, yeah, it's a good one for sure. Get that on replay squad folks. Uh, and good morning. And we have um, Jeff also coming in. Jeff Fuller, Fuller and Burks. Good morning. Adelina is in. Hello. Uh, I'm assuming that's you, Todd. <laughs> Facebook user, my friend. Yo, what's up? Good to have you in. Uh, Justin Armena, Jay Digitizing is here. And Jeff and Adam. So Adam of BJJHats.com is here as well as <laughs> Jeff of Fuller Embroidery Works. See, I'm trying to shout everybody out. That's what we do on the half. We support. All right. Uh, Ramona says, lots of what I have heard before from our own local, local personal mentor and instructor. Yeah, like I said, uh, Joe Kramer and I have a lot in common as far as how we think about uh, decoration and how we think about embroidery. And I'll say this, um, I, later on today on the take up, I'm going to talk about how I got my inspiration because very much like Joe today, I kind of started out my career entirely in the dark. I didn't come at this with, a, you know, and honestly, not even with as much training kind of as Joe had. Uh, I came at this as somebody with a completely different degree with just a, a desire to, in fact, I didn't have a degree at the time, of course, I came in right out of school. Um, had a desire to do this work and I, I had a desire to learn more and to control the embroidery machines, but uh, I had to get my inspiration on the fly. And I'm going to talk about the, that on the take up today. Um, where did I go for inspiration? How did I get it? And a lot of my inspiration came from looking at retail sources in fashion, as well as just a host of other kind of needle arts. Uh, like I said, consume broadly and create with focus means just that. I consumed a lot of embroidery and needle arts and fiber arts in the process of trying to find out how can I make embroidery how can i make an image with thread and all the different ways it can be done and the cool thing listening to joe is that he specifically that was his career that was his job was working on research and development for Abercrombie and fitch and making new ways to create images out of thread right making new ways to create those images and to make marks with thread in a way that was meaningful and valuable and had a lot of creative sense to it so that was cool like i said go go back and check out especially jump on facebook jump on youtube uh, look up the two other guys uh, two other guys talking decoration podcast that is where you're going to find it i should have a link handy and i don't right now as i'm producing myself um, but the truth of the matter is that was a great show from joe and i think joe and i were already talking about it we're probably going to have to do a take up episode with a special guest or maybe we'll do a special off stream after hours kind of thing with uh joe and me just nerding out on topics we'll have to see how that goes that's that's it's in the future it might be on two other guys might be on my show but uh for sure watch our channels and you will find more about it but yeah Really cool stuff. And yeah, Ramona, I, I admit, I was hard not to soapbox in the middle of that because all the stuff that Joe was talking about was like, you could have been out of my articles for the last 10 years. Uh, stuff that I've been fighting for for a long time, like those techniques. And also things like um, how to deal with cover-ups, how to do visible mending is, is a term that's out there now. And I think we can actually use embroidery for that in a way that opens up new avenues for the people who are contra fast fashion, who don't want to do the fast fashion thing. There's a lot that we can do and it's really pretty interesting stuff. All right, so Bill says, good to RG. Glad to hear that, Bill. Thank you for listening in. Uh, yep, Moss and Santa Fe, good morning. Happy to have you in as well. Uh, Barb's coming in. Hi, uh, Barb, happy to have you in. Another Barbara <laughs> from Oregon. So we got uh, Minnesota, we got Oregon. We got the Barbers in force. Thank you. Good morning. Happy to have you in here. Sheila is in. Hi, Sheila. Mike, of course, our friend in Canada. Hey, 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 Mike. Happy to have you in. And uh, yeah, <laughs> Ramona says it. Yep. That would be awesome. Love the after hours idea. I'll get with Joe. Like I said, I think Joe and I are probably going to do a show. We've been wanting to. And I've talked with Joe before. He's an awesome guy. So I really have enjoyed that. And Susan says Joe was very informative this morning. So yeah, if I have not sold you on the two regular guys this morning already, uh, everybody else who has already listened to it will sell you on it. Go check them out. And by all means, I think it's worth doing. Um, if I have some takeaways to give you out of that, and I think this is something that's worthwhile doing for this show, uh, some takeaways out of what he said were certainly these. And like I said, these are things, if you've listened to my shows, you already know. Uh, number one, perceived value is huge. If your client, if the person to whom you are selling apparel perceives, believes that what you have, what you are bringing to them is of more value than someone else's, they are willing to pay more for it. And that can be done without a tremendous amount of material outlay, or at the very least, it doesn't just take stitches. It doesn't just take more materials or higher quality items to get more out of a client. If you bring value to them that they can perceive, they are going to be able to and be willing to reward you with higher prices for the garments with uh, more repeat work. And I've found that in my career, uh, being able to provide creative solutions and to honestly, for the people who just want to be the person with the cool gear, 
I can't tell you how many times I've had a company who says, I don't want to have the same uniform apparel that everybody else has. I want something that my employees enjoy, or I want to project to the people who see my employees an air of cool, an air of being with it, an air of having something interesting, or a design that is somehow related materially to what we do. Let's say you work in, you work with upholstery, you're somebody who does car, cool classic cars, doing a jacket bag that has an inset vinyl applique that looks like upholstery is going to be of incredible value to them even though it's a little more set up on your side you may be charging you know 5x which you would for the same stitch count with a different kind of applique in standard tackle twill there is something to be said for these creative solutions that appeal to people's culture that have novelty to them and by the way i say this all the time novelty will drive people to buy they not, won't always buy the novel idea but even if they just see you creating novel, interesting treatments, they see you as a creative person. And the funny thing is that they will then come and hand you the, your dead bog standard regular polyester embroidery left chest to do because you're the creative person who can do it right. Even though they look at the crazy creative thing you do and then they come in and order a normal thing because that's what they want. It is something very useful to know. So perceived value, increasing perceived value is worthwhile. And I think that it's... Uh, it's fair to say if you're looking for the right markets, if you target it correctly, and that's another thing that Joe talked about today, if you target it correctly to the kind of people who uh, are going to see that value in it, and if you look at who you are selling to and find the cultural touchstones, the things that make sense to them that align with who they want to be, what they want to project, or what's important to them, and mix that into the way you do your work, you're going to be worth more. And even if there is more material outlay, even if there is investment in that, uh, frankly, it's not always a lot of investment. There are lots of things we can do with embroidery that don't take much more work than our existing uh, embroidery that we do now. Sometimes it's literally a material swap. Uh, Joe showed using a thicker wool blend thread, and that is a small digitizing change and a little bit more cleanup on the machines. And you can make some fairly uh, interesting treatments without really redoing everything you do or using things like um, different stitch types, width stitch types, bean stitches instead of straight stitches where we can emulate handwork. And you guys have seen me uh, teach on that several times. We can emulate different kinds of embroidery and mark making with thread uh, without going into a crazy level of expense or difficulty and bring something that looks very new without changing our process as embroiderers very much. So really cool stuff, right? Really cool stuff. And I think it's worthwhile. If I take something away from it, it is that perceived value. It is that we can add to what our clients perceive out of us. And we can bring something that actually does have some marketable value to them because they're going to get more impressions. And that's something actually Jeremy Picker of uh, Amber Creative, Jeremy said in the comments is that one of the great things about doing high-end decoration or interesting treatments is that people are more likely to wear it more often, which means as a promotional item, if we think about this as marketing, as a promotional product, the number of impressions, the number of times your logo is seen will increase the more someone wears it. So if instead of making something bog standard, we make something that's interesting or better yet, if it's novel enough that the person who is wearing this garment, who owns this garment, voluntarily wants to show people how cool it is or show people the interesting feature you've built in, when you make that kind of garment, people will absolutely look to show that to someone when they show that off they have a pride as someone who not only owns the cool object but can show something to someone else that they've never seen and that pride of showing the novelty the desire to be the cool person who has the cool thing which all of us kind of have leads them to increase the number of impressions to have your logo in front of them and also as a decorator to recommend you for that work if you have something attached to it so also one of the great things you can do when you're doing cool pieces like that um to if you're doing something for a local client who will let you do it, if they allow you to put your own branding or tagging in a piece, that is incredible. Sometimes, especially on the higher end stuff, it can be a real benefit to provide your own contact information as a decorator too. Not everybody loves that. That can be a controversial topic. Uh, I have at times had the luck of being able to hang tag a garment with the decorator information, even though it was a second tier, you know, it was disconnected from me by my client then selling or using it with someone else. Uh, if they were doing a cool giveaway, they were doing something like that where they don't have the skin in the game. You sometimes can get that, especially if you provide a small discount. You can say, all right, I want to promote my business as well as a potential decorator. And some folks will let you do that. So it's, it's an interesting thing to do. 
but it's all uh, it's a holistic effort we make to kind of make this stuff happen i'm actually going to bring up a comment that's great uh, jeremy says the right design product and decoration makes that perfect garment and here's the thing i've said a million times over uh what i also want to stress with this because embroiderers we have a bad habit we get something digitized one especially embroiderers who don't digitize i think it's a little more simple to do this but all of us because we're busy and we don't want to limit our exposure we will make a design once and then put it on everything uh, people are always asking me, how do I design something so that I can put on a hat and a shirt and a bag and everything else? And I'm like, you can do that. And that's a great concept to make things easy. And business to business, it happens all the time. But what I always tell people is coordinate, don't replicate. If you look at uniforms from you know a really higher end kind of retail experience, or if you look at, honestly, you look at, at, at retail stores, you look at retail brands, even brands that we know and love. Uh, and one of the ones I love to talk about is like sports or, hey, you go look at like DC apparel, you look at streetwear, you look at whatever it is, skatewear, whatever it is, they may have a logo. Like I, I've given the example with DC before where they've got the big DC logo. Everybody knows what it looks like, but it's not executed in the same colors, in the same shape and size on every hat, on every garment. They use different materials. They use different colors and they maintain branding so it, it is certainly throughout we can tell what it is it's identifiable luckily they have a great outline on their logo so you can see it from a silhouette and you know what it is but they have coordination the hat is not exactly the same logo that's on the left chest i can imagine if someone's coming up to you they're working for whatever company they're working for and they have the exact same logo on the left chest and the hat these things are now uh, really not doing different jobs they're not interesting in and of themselves if you have some portion of your logo like you've got a, a monogram out of logo you've got a device whatever a design is part of a logo type that's now on the hat let's say we had some graphical device that then is accompanied with some text well we have the full logo type with the text on the left chest we have just the logo on the hat maybe text over the back now we have a coordinated set and an outfit that allows us not only to upsell because we can upsell the entire outfit as a collection but it gives you this kind of design feeling like someone has spent time to think of the holistic piece and it it's something that you can charge more for and you can also provide to them as kind of like a style guide style book but also even on individual garments i gotta say jerry's right here you bring the design to it and the design and the garment should go together it also means that though sometimes over the years a company will just want same logo same logo on everything if you get a company that wants something creative and interesting, it's great to be able to provide variations for their logo that are taking the garment in mind. They are making the garment and the season and the particular season the company is in every year when they come back to you in mind so that they have a series of interesting things that's a history of their progression. I think it's really awesome to see. So I love that stuff. Love that stuff. All right, so, and I, I don't know, this may be you who's out in Santa Fe, I hope so. Uh, she says, love seeing my embroidery folks around a small town, makes me happy. To this day, I, and <laughs> this is not me knocking my old company. Uh, you guys know that uh, I worked at Black Duck. I will see Black Duck advertising stuff from a company that's still using my digitizing this many years down the road. And I still feel the same way. I still feel proud. And I go, I did that piece. I did that piece. I, and certainly I've seen them doing lots of new companies and uh, that I haven't done the digitizing for. But I, I've always loved, even to this point, I love when I see one of those pieces that still has legs under it. And what, by the way, whenever I talk about um, caring about the quality of what you do as a digitizer embroiderer. One of the reasons I do that is because I know from my own experience, sometimes people wear stuff for 20 years. I mean, a piece of outerwear may be in someone's closet for 20 years. And funny enough, they may then donate it and it comes back as thrift when that era of garments is popular again. And then that thing gets a life of 40 years or your file may be around for the next several decades. You never know. Cause I have also told you guys, uh, the, when I originally started digitizing, some of the files I had were hand-punched individual stitch-by-stitch -stitch files from years ago at that point already, from a decade before I started. And now I'm 20 plus years out from there. If you think people aren't sometimes running files that have been translated repeatedly for 30 years you're, or more, more, you're wrong. They, they have been. So you never know when your stuff's going to live beyond you. So I love that stuff. All right. Uh, Ramona always says, I tell people, look at how many different variations of logos that Coke has. It's not the same on everything. No, it's not. And same thing, sports teams. Sports teams have a mascot. They have a style guide. They have a set of colors. And the colors will be pretty you know, unified, and they will stick to those Pantone colors. 
but they color block their garments differently. They change up the way they execute things. They have, uh, they come up with new type combinations or they have a new font they will add to things and they will change it up over the years. And if you look at the stuff that they're doing as far as fan gear, Yes, it's in the same colors. Yes, the logo may appear or the mascot may appear, but look at all the treatments. Look at all the different materials they use. Look at the various ways that they execute it, the different positions on the garments that they use. It's not the same thing every time. They're incre they're absolutely doing the most work in organizing the thing. They're not redesigning the mascot every time they go out, no. But they're thinking holistically about the garment and thinking about position, they're thinking about materials, they're thinking about what's current, and they're making versions on that that speak to the audience they want to hit, right? They're speaking to the audience that they want to buy the garment that's involved, and that's what's happening in general. And then why, why do I look at retail? Why am I still always doing retail research uh, when I want to get inspired? Uh, that's because the people out there have a vested interest in it. And if you heard the show this morning with Joe, Abercrombie and Fitch at that time, so these, these are in dollars that are worth a lot more than today's dollars, uh, especially right now. At that time, they set up a $4 million research department from scratch just to come up with new treatments and ways to treat things, ways to do things. But like Joe said, and like I've been saying, at the end of the day, the things they came up with, though they're very creative and awesome, are not things that are beyond you in your own embroidery shop most of the things they're doing there may be some specialty materials some stuff has to have a wash before it goes out the door and that can be difficult for us in you know in traditional decorated apparel especially business to business people don't always love a pre-wash garment and we may not be set up to do pre-wash garments some of those treatments are like that but there's a ton of decoration treatments that are out there in the retail space that are not beyond us and we can get inspired by them. I'm not saying go knock off your local, you know, Hollister or Abercrombie and Fitch or, you know, American Eagle place. Don't go over there and just knock off the first design you see. But you can take hints about color palettes, about materials that are being used, about uh, decoration placement, stuff like that. I'm going to talk about that today. So tune back into the take up this afternoon if you want to hear more about that. Uh, I'm going to talk about getting inspired and where I got that from. And a little bit about how to select stitch types and things like that too, to a degree. Uh, I know I'll be treading over ground that I've trod before, but hey, when you're 120 episodes in and when you are you lead this yourself from questions from new people coming into the industry all the time, you're going to trod the boards once, once or twice. Uh, the thing that'll be interesting in this one is I'm going to tell personal stories about how I got inspired and honest, honestly in a semi-pre-internet age, or at the very least, in an age where the internet as it is now wasn't there. And then I'll talk about what's so much different now. But yeah, it's it's something to think about, folks. If you want to create higher value, and honestly, if you want to extract higher value, you want to get paid more per piece, one of the best things you can do is think about the perception of value, and that's of your entire business. What is it that I'm providing to a customer that they will see as valuable? Because it can be things as ephemeris, as, uh, <laughs> or ephemeral or as uh, strange and outside of the box and as immaterial as a good experience with you. If they like your personality, they like the way you address things or things that are not related to the decoration. They like the ease of use. They uh, appreciate the way you package things. They like the way you help them with events maybe or distribution. Those things can be a part of it. Heck, they can be the packaging. They might like the packaging. They might like the presentation. Those things can all be there. And we want to increase value with our decoration. The thing I'm going to tell you is, this is a great secret. Sometimes applique is faster than the embroidery process. Yes, there is still other processes that go into having it cut and placing it. But when we compare it to a really large tatami fill with 40 weight thread, obviously it's faster to throw down a big applique. I, at least it has been in my, in my studies, especially when you're getting down to understanding what you're doing and doing it quickly. Um, applique can save you money and time, funny enough. It can uh most certainly things like thicker threads once you're tuned in and you know what you're doing with them of course if you reduce the tens the density massively you have you know a third of the stitches then your stitch count is lower but your garment looks better it's incredible it's incredible what you can get done but we have a couple of other good comments here i want to grab some comments i know i talk real fast and get right at it and i will fill up this, this 30 minutes quickly but let me grab a couple more comments before we kind of get toward the the last section of the half it's harder to cut myself off but we will still keep that 30 minute 
timer running here. Uh, a couple things that we have here. First, Adelina says, I drive my husband crazy with I did that logo. Even today, where I am not digitizing commercially on a daily basis, I'm working here at Imbrilliance, developing assets for you folks, and honestly doing a lot of e-commerce and other things that I learned to do over the years. Um, I still see things that I do, and I still have seen lots of pieces that I've digitized, either that I digitized before or that I, I are still literally being used for my files, and I still I still do that. And when I was currently digitizing every day, where I was kicking out multiple logos, sometimes ten logos in a day absolutely i was telling everybody <laughs> about which thing i looked at uh, the worst thing is i was constantly looking to see if my department had executed it well or how it was holding up with where which is not great because you're staring at people same thing as getting inspired by other people's garments be careful where you're staring and for how long they don't know it's the clothes just gonna say and from uh, a six foot four eric who's uh, mildly imposing i've heard in person um Maybe staring at people randomly in a crowd is not the best thing I can be doing. It's a good thing I usually look pretty happy. Uh, all right, Jeremy says, I like to say creativity is the gateway to opportunity. You have to figure out a way to use what you have to capture new client types or decoration output. Eric gives so many ideas how to do this. Thank you, Jeremy. And honestly, so does Jeremy. You should go follow him. If you haven't seen any of the style guides from Amber, you are missing out. And honestly, heck, it, when Jeremy does partnerships, people should hire him. I know his business is full. His dance card's full right now. But the kind of crazy merch stuff he does is fantastic. You should go check it out. Uh, and Mike says, by the way, Mike, Mike knows uh, of what he speaks since he's done a lot of it. Um, applique is so rad. Fast to cut, fast to sew. And in the eyes of many customers, it's the top of the mountain and therefore commands more value and price. Uh, love that GM. Grows to great margin. Yes. I love applique. Um haven't always had a chance to do as much of it as I would have loved to in my career. But when I did, the, the upside was always so great. Plus, I'm going to tell you the truth. There are some of the pieces that I've done in my career where applique just saved my life, right? One of the ones I think about, and I don't think I can grab it on screen fast enough to show you. I will try. I'll see if I can grab something on screen. There was a piece that I did for a local salsa company called Gilly Loco Salsa. And if I can grab it, I will I will certainly try and grab it and put it on screen. Uh, Producing all by myself means this might not happen in like two minutes that I have left. But we had to do a jacket back very quickly, very, very quickly. Um, I mean, without a doubt, it was the fastest turnout we had to do because we had to do massive number of jacket backs real fast for a high end party once the uh, corporate folks showed up. And actually, I do have the piece. So I'm going to see if I can add add my screen and I'll pull these up so you can see them live. So uh, we'll, we will go ahead and share my screen and we'll give you a little chance at this <laughs> to see some of the stuff that I'm talking about. So I'll add this to the screen. This is the Gilly Loco piece. And I've actually got zoomed in pieces. Here's the whole thing. Uh, Gilly Loco applique. We had to provide these for a business party that was going on with a bunch of investors and we had to do it very quick. And I had to do this in a day. I had to go from nothing in a day to these. And how we did it, quite literally, the thing that made this piece go, number one, I did something that I will tell you to never do. I started from my left chest logo. The left chest logo and the art they had was not vector art, as I recall, or at the very least, there was something wrong with the vector art because I couldn't just start from vector entirely. But I used pieces from my left chest logo and I blew it up to jacket back size. Yes, I know. Trust me, I'm a professional. I thought about what I was doing first and did some editing once I got there. And I tore out the original fill that was in here, but I didn't have time to be messing around with shading and playing around with everything. The shading that was already there, in fact, these stripes on the back were, uh, and you can see some of the shading. There's some shadow work that's still in here, but the stripes were feathered in a better way and there was better shading in the original piece but they just weren't sized right for what we could do. And trying to redo all the shading and stuff that was going to have to be done the layers for the jacket pack wasn't an option. So I did some interesting textures in the fills. I went ahead and uh, redid the logo, uh, the, the main logo type text as fill with a, a tight fill with a small satin border. We threw a standard backdrop of a uh, twill behind the Gilly Loco text. But here back, this is uh, upholstery material that has a like a crocodile print it's embossed it has thickness it has density and what was interesting is when we did this piece everybody loved it but it had to be quick and dirty and i'm going to tell you the applique sold this i didn't make this thing great the applique made it great the, the embroidery was fairly normal but the applique brought an immense amount of color texture and depth to the process applique can do a lot now don't get me wrong cutting this rubbery applique with a roller cutter was madness it was horrible but it's possible. So you can do a lot with what you have. And with that, folks, that's the half.
You know, I think I might really talk a little fast. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Catch you next week.